There was an old song called Dollar Marlow about the legendary man of the Quebec Hills. How did that one come along? I met the lawyer at uh, his home. I had heard about this old fellow that was living uh, ever since uh, World War uh, Mm II. He had had gone as a conscientious objector way back into the woods to live, as a lot of people did back then. And he was living on a bend of a creek, crossroads of uh, the local roads, including the Kaywood Road. And uh, so I went to see him, and I met him, uh, and was mesmerized by his uh, just his he was so one with the earth and the universe and, and, and so disassociated from all the trappings of humankind big cars and fancy houses and all that stuff he just had a little log shack he was very very proud of it he walked me over to the wood and he told me in French c'est moi qui fais ça tout seul tout seul c'est moi he was saying it's me that did this all by myself I did all this and here I felt the wood that he was, was and uh, so anyway I got to know Dollar a little bit and I wrote a um, I was down in Fiji when I got a phone call from my business manager, and he told me uh, it was the middle of a it was the middle of a, of a hurricane. Oh, is that and, right? Yeah. Fiji, and uh, the radio phone was working at this lodge we were at, but everything else, everything was buggered up except this hand crank type radio phone, whatever the heck they had. And mm-hmm. long story short, they actually connected me with this call from George Wazine. George said, Wayne, I thought you'd want to know that uh, Adelore Marlou, which was his full French name, Adelore Marlou. Okay. I anglicized it to Dollar Marlou. Adelore Marlou, Adelore passed away. Oh my God. And uh, when I came back to Canada after that holiday, I remember going up to the cabin and uh, there had been a table in there that uh, Dollar had. Yes. That we sat at and we had tea at at this table. It had axe marks right in the corner where he would sit He'd have, he'd, uh, he'd put his, uh, he'd whittle. Yes, he'd pass the time, he would whittle. So mm-hmm. he'd put a stick of wood on the table and he'd go down with his knife and take slices of wood off. And <laughs> so the wood had all these little, t- tabletop at that corner had all these marks of Adelore's jackknife. Um, and I wondered where that table was. And I thought it was such a beautiful old table. It just turned gray. Because he never painted anything. He just lived in this. Yeah. So in okay. such a natural way. And he was 90, 98 when, uh, when he died. He oh, yeah. had taken several old age homes and run away from them and gone back to his cabin right exactly. through the book 15 miles. And I uh, I heard those stories and that's what prompted the song about uh, taking him to a, you know, an old age home and stuff like that. Exactly. And I got a phone call, oh, years and years later. It was from uh, Adelore's, uh, uh, his nephew, actually, his nephew. And the nephew said he heard me in a radio interview talking about the old table that Dollar had that I sat at and had tea with uh, with Dollar. And uh, he said, I have that table. But he said, after listening to your interview, that table's not mine anymore, it's yours. Is that right? And I said, I can't believe that. And he said, yep. He said, you come and get this table. And he gave me his address up in the garden. And I went up and I have that table to this day. It's down in my music room. Oh, you still got it. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, yes. I knew you I had more uh, dollar or whatever you want to call him. He, uh, he lives yeah. with me still, yeah. Well, that's great. Because I knew you moved from the East Coast back to Ontario recently. A table followed me. It's followed me everywhere across Canada, yeah. Well, that's great. So those listening are not unfamiliar with your work on uh, CBC's greatest local television show, On the Road Again. Well, that's, um, you put a lovely spin on that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it was a remarkable show in the sense that uh, we were we were given a mandate to travel the country for maybe three years. They figured it would, it would be about a three-year run. Oh, yeah. And we, and we went uh, over 20. It says a lot. It said that we were doing stories about ordinary Canadians who did extraordinary things. And yes. It captured the imagination of the whole country. And uh, to this day, time is a funny thing. You know, when you run into someone, uh, people's perception of time are all different. But for some people, 10 years ago, it could be feel like yesterday. Exactly. And I, know, I know that because I still, to this day, we've been off the air since 2007. Okay. We've been off the air for 13 years. That's when On the Road Again finished his 20th season. And I still have people who walk up and go past me in a shopping mall and go, oh my gosh, Wayne Rostead. I would say, hey, how are you? And they'd say, you know, I watch your show every week. It's fabulous. Uh-huh. And I walk. <laughs> and I chuckle and I think, gee, that's 13 years ago, man. But I'll, I'll tell you 
take it if it feels that fresh in your mind. That's exactly. Well, yeah, it, it was a great run. Um, it was, uh, I never went to work to only a day in my life with that show. I went to visit neighbors. Exactly. I hear you there. It's the same as yeah. the Jamboree here. Visiting with you is, I don't call it work. I call it a, a friendship. Same, same sense, same spiritual sense, yeah. And uh, so... That was uh, before it was on the road again. I did a show called Country Reports, which yes. was a regional show in, in the valley here in the Ottawa Valley. It was played actually around Kingston as well, and uh, of course, the yes. other parts of the Seaway Valley, the Rideau Valley. Um, anyway, it was called Country Report, and that was uh, ten years. So mm -hmm. all told, I had uh, there, there was the pilot show for On the Road Again, which was called Out Your Way with Wayne Rosted. Yes. So all told, I had thirty-one years of doing Amazing. this lifestyle show, and. Uh, so it's not surprising to say that I miss it to this day because after 31 years of... It's your life and... Yeah, it became a way of life to... Exactly. to do it. And you know, the, the, the show was so simple to do. It was... In order to get a successful TV show, sometimes you, they do the most convoluted things imaginable to get it to work, try yes. to make it work. They do it. Ours was the simplest formula you ever imagined. Mm -hmm. We just did ordinary people who did extraordinary things. And we just went there, and the biggest question was always the same thing. Why are you doing this? And it led to the stories and the songs that I wrote about them and all the things that went on for years and years and decades. Exactly. And that sets a tone for a lot of things. And uh, it certainly gave me a sense of the country. I wish everybody could have had the opportunity or one day has the opportunity to do what I did, which is to see this country from corner to corner, from sea to sea to sea, and to go to the last house at the end of the last road in the community, and to sit with genuine people who understand and appreciate that having a loaf of bread and butter in the fridge and a, and a grandchild playing on the floor is exactly. heaven. And you can see the joy, and you can see it gives you an attitude about living life that uh, I would do the same thing again in a heartbeat. Would you? I would, okay. I, yes. would, I wouldn't change a thing. I would I do see. it exactly the same. I see. It was, it was the most fabulous era of my life. And another thing that was a fabulous era of your life was the Chio, Christmas in the Valley. Yeah, Chio's always been my pet, uh, my charity of choice. Just because I know what they do for children and what they've done historically has been phenomenal. Uh, I've donated to them in many, many ways. I did the team before I started Christmas. Christmas in the Valley, I was doing the teddy bear picnics as an, as an artist, uh, entertainer, mm -hmm. uh, and raising money for Chiel. And um, when I started the Christmas in the Valley story with the radio station in Ottawa, CKBY FM, yes. and we started recording songs based on, a, on a, a format called Christmas in the Valley with Wayne Rostad and Friends. All of these artists got together, and eventually all the national artists, you know, and, and, you know, and that included uh, uh, Ronnie Prophet and uh, Lucille Starr, and Mercy Brothers, and, yes. you know, Ronnie Brown, everybody. We all gave our mechanical rights to the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. And uh, in seven years of doing CDs and albums, mm -hmm. uh, we raised over half a million dollars for Chio. When that finished, I just kept going with my touring uh, to this day, which was interrupted by COVID, of course. Yes. Uh, up until COVID last year, uh, we were doing a five-city tour, which included Kingston at the Grand Theatre. Yes, and Cornwall and, as well, yeah. Uh, and Cornwall, we went to Cornwall and did mm -hmm. all the uh, theatre, and, uh, and raising money for Chio. And uh, as soon as COVID is over, we will do it again. Uh, but I have to I have to caution uh, optimism here, because um, it's going to take a while, I believe, for people to feel safe again. Yes, for uh, sure. To be, you know, I, I can't find it in my heart this fall to ask people to come to a theater and sit down next to their new best friend behind them, beside them, and in front of them. Exactly. And, uh, because nobody's going to be comfortable doing that for a while. I think we're going to need some time. Uh, COVID has, uh, has had a lot of uh, far-reaching effect on uh, on society as we know and especially it. you performers that's for sure well yeah. we're a huggy kind of lot you know it's exactly there'll be a lot less of that for a while yes until, until this becomes until this becomes memory until we start feeling safe again but 
Long story short, if it doesn't take too long, and I'm not too long in the tooth, then I can still walk. Mm -hmm. uh, (laughs) We might might have another Christmas in the Valley concert, but I don't think it'll be this year. Didn't have one this past uh, Christmas. Yeah, but you did. You had a virtual one. I did my virtual show. I did a 90-minute show solo, and uh, Mm -hmm. we still made several thousand dollars for Chio. Did you? Okay, good. I'll do another virtual show probably this coming uh, December if uh, we're not doing a live show. But I I tend to think it'll be a virtual show before it'll be live this year. Now, maybe in two years' time, we'll be ready to uh, go back to the theaters. We'll see. I see. Okay, sure. And there is a story that you tell on stage that I would like to ask you about, if you would tell us about it. Uh, The chicken story. Well, there's several chicken stories. The (laughs) one about the rooster and the the, uh, mature chickens. (laughs) Well, I'm not sure that I have a specific joke about it. It, it, It's it's one of those things I do by improv. I just start talking on stage about chickens. and I found that an audience, for some reason, seems to enjoy the whole topic. And if I ask somebody, if I ask an audience, okay, everybody that's had a a memory with a chicken in any way, shape, or form, shout out. Well, they all shout. They're amazing. Half of that theater, the theater will shut something out. And uh, I have, you know, several chicken stories, but the one that comes to mind more than anything was my son when we first moved to the country in Pakenham Township. We bought a farm, yeah. and uh, I decided we were going to be farmers. And uh, I did the typical thing a lot of city yeah. folk do. They buy a farm, and they think that they're automatically farmers because they own a farm. Well, that's the last furthest thing from the truth you're going to ever find, because farming exactly. is something you learn over generations. Yeah. So, anyway, I went to see a farmer, uh, the name of Carl Williams, on the uh, on the Upper Dwyer Hill Road. And he had mm-hmm. chickens in the front yard and I had driven by and my son said he wanted to raise chickens. So we went over and I asked him if he would sell those chickens. Oh yeah. He said, you want, you want to buy these chickens? He said, I said, yeah, I want to buy those chickens. Well, Johnny, <laughs> he sold me eight seven-year-old hens. <laughs> yes. When I took those seven-year-old hens home to the roost that we had just cleaned completely at the farm and put all new shavings in and Oh my gosh, it was built all new little pens for the, and we put those plump seven year old hens <laughs> all in there, and we just waited for them to, but nothing was happening. Yes. So I had to go back to Carl Williams, who really saw me coming again, and I just said, Carl, there's not a lot happening here, I'm not getting, you know, no egg production, and he said, well, geez, boy, you need a, you need a rooster. <laughs> wow, well, I, I knew that, my God, I'm a farmer now, so I thought. So he sold me a seven inch Banty rooster. Yeah. Little wee seven inch <laughs> Promptly when I put him in with the seven, with the eight seven year old hens, and I left him there <laughs> a couple of years later. That little bandy rooster was stone dead. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Laying on his back with a little beak up with a big smile on it. <laughs> and those little hens were so happy. But anyway, then we gave up on raising eggs and we decided we'd raise meat, so we put them in the freezer. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, you know, I don't know if you've ever eaten a seven year old hen or not, but shoe leather comes to mind. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so we tried, we, we tried eating the chickens. <laughs> it was the most god awful chicken. So I, we took them out of the fish and took them to the dump, and that was the end of it. Yes. I never again was to be a chicken farmer who would want to be. But that's uh, my, the, the key memory I have about chickens trying to raise eggs. And that was it. At least my son had an opportunity to try it. Yes. Exactly. still not to it to this day. So, in closing today, I'd like you to tell us about Lolly Ray. That was one of your earliest songs. To saw Lolly, I just went to see him. Yes. Lolly was 58 years older than I am. I'm okay. 73. He's yes. 88. Uh, he's now uh, a resident of uh, a senior uh, residence in, in Wakefield, Quebec. Oh, yes. Okay. So, what do you feel? Uh, things, many things don't change. Ray was Ray is what Ray has always been, a man who went back to the land and lived a life of solitude and, you know, simple philosophies. As I say in the song, he taught me that heaven was a simple life, a, a trusting friend, a loving wife. And we took the time back then to watch the flower grow. And, uh, and t- that hasn't changed for Ray. It was good to see him again. And uh, so to this day, uh, Ray remi- remains my mentor in many, many ways. He gave me a philosophy about living uh, life and uh, philosophy of love and taught me about integrity and kindness and all the things that uh, that matter in a social uh, circle. Yes, exactly. I tried to apply that, but I just saw him. Some of you asked because uh, yeah. uh, he's on my mind to call again. I'd like to keep in touch and see how he's doing. But he's doing well, thank you. 88 and uh, still, uh, still 
nothing happened, yeah? One last. When can we look forward to new music from you? Well, I've been writing stuff because of COVID. Yes. I do have several things that uh, Joe Turner, my producer, a bunch of years now, has been uh, expressing interest. To get, we get together and we listen to what it is I've pulled out of the, out of the, uh, out of the soul here and, uh, and to see what we have. Uh, so we'll probably play around with that soon. I would okay. sooner than later. I mean, well, that'd be amazing to hear something new from you, yeah. Yeah, that's one of those things that uh, I guess W.W. Wheeling, West Virginia stayed with me a lot longer than I thought it would. That's for sure, yes. Well, I want to thank you for being on the show today and uh, we'll be in touch hopefully sooner than later with this COVID and uh, hopefully there's more years of Christmas in the Valley with you. Appreciate it, Johnny. And big hello to all your listeners and thank you so much for your support over all the years. Look well, forward to talking to you again, John. Same here. God bless you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Sleigh bells ringing in the snow Kissing neat the mistletoe Out in the barn the cattle low It's Christmas in the valley And soon beneath the Christmas tree We'll gather with our families Love in perfect harmony it's Christmas in the valley Oh, the valley lights will shine so bright And all the world will be so right When Santa on his magic night Comes to his children There'll be sleigh bells ringing in the snow Kissing neath the mistletoe Out in the barn the cattle low It's Christmas in the valley Candlelight and hearts aglow the silent dance of falling snow Familiar songs on the radio That's Christmas in the valley In every town the church bells ring In every home a young child dreams In every heart the spirit sings It's Christmas in the valley All the world will be so right When Santa on that magic night Comes to his children There'll be sleigh bells ringing in the snow And kissing neath the mistletoe Out in the barn the cattle low It's Christmas in the valley Christmas in the valley